Hello and uh, welcome back to AP English Language Class. I uh, hope you guys are doing well. We had an excellent weekend. Last week we finished Unit 5 and we took our Unit 5 uh, test, uh, which you guys did a good job of submitting electronically. Uh, sorry for any inconveniences uh, that you were met with, but uh, we are doing a good job overall of adapting uh, to these abnormal circumstances. All right, so um, what I want to do before we get started uh, with uh, the final unit of the year, uh, which is dedicated to synthesis. Uh, today we're going to be looking at Lecture 1, which simply uh, identifies what synthesis is, why we do synthesis, and, and how uh, synthesis is accomplished, and how we're going to use synthesis uh, in our last month and a half of the class. Uh, before we do that, uh, I want to go over um, some of the key changes that have occurred in the AP English Language exam, uh, which were articulated in an email that I sent to you on Friday, uh, April 3rd. So let's uh, quickly take a look at that uh, email together. All right. Um, the College Board recently announced that they are going to be uh, pivoting to a one-question exam, uh, and that one question will be a rhetorical analysis uh, question. Uh, evaluating your ability to explain the way in which an author attempts to make their claim or their the central impression or purpose of their text um, appealing to their audience. All right, so that is what we discussed uh, throughout the course of the entire uh, first semester. Uh, you're going to have 45 minutes to write. Um, your response on the day of the exam, uh, and we're going to be taking that exam on May 20th at 2 p.m. All right, so uh, I've attached an exact replica of the information that they released, uh, which is here. Okay, so our test date, May 20th. Uh, we're going to have 45 minutes to respond to one question, uh, and it's going to be the first free response question of the exam. Uh, which is the rhetorical analysis question. The rhetorical analysis question uh, is going to be around 600 to 800 words uh, of uh, analytical writing that's going to feature a thesis, uh, evidence that supports the thesis, uh, and then uh, commentary that explains the evidence that demonstrates an understanding of the rhetorical situation and uses appropriate grammar and punctuation throughout uh, the analysis. Okay, uh, so uh, one important pivot that we're going to be uh, making as a class is that instead of the progress checks uh, being oriented towards multiple choice uh, uh, prompts and questions, we are going to uh, just simply, uh, once a week, practice responding to a rhetorical analysis prompt. All right, uh, You're going to write one of those practice essays uh, on AP Classroom. All right, uh, so it'll be assigned to you. You'll see a prompt. The prompt will tell you to do a certain thing. Um, and then we are going to discuss those practice essays uh, together on a weekly basis. Okay, so no more multiple choice garbage. Uh, I am uh, very pleased uh, with this move. I think this is a good move on the College Board's behalf. I think this is a better assessment of your knowledge of rhetoric, okay, this, uh, this requirement. Uh, of a rhetorical analysis essay. Okay, so we're going to be looking at the rhetorical analysis uh, uh, rubric. We're going to be uh, practicing rhetorical analysis essays all the way up until uh, May 20th um, and all the way uh, uh, in preparation for that exam. All right, so um, uh, we're going to pivot away from that for now and we're going to look back at the content uh, that will not uh, be covered on the exam directly. Uh, it normally is, uh, but it is part of the AP English Language curriculum, uh, which we are uh, going to finish uh, to the best of our ability uh, throughout the course of the rest of the next month and a half. All right. So uh, what we're going to be doing uh, throughout the course of this week is obviously looking at Lecture 1, like I said. Uh, we're going to look at Lecture 2 tomorrow, which is going to talk about how to use sources properly. Uh, we're going to uh, begin OTN1, which is going to analyze uh, a selection of documents from the American Jeremiad. Uh, we're going to complete the Unit 5 progress check, which is the last multiple choice progress check that we're going to be doing. Uh, and then we're going to begin the Unit 6 progress check, which is going to be a free response question. Uh, it is already assigned and available to you uh, if you want to go ahead and get started on that. That's obviously going to be due next Tuesday, all right, seven days after April 7th, okay? Um, so through the course of the week, what you need to do is make sure that your Unit 5 progress check is completed. 
uh, and that you are working on your Unit 6 prog progress check after Tuesday, April 7th. Uh, you need to send me a con confirmation or, uh, email uh, indicating the fact that you have completed OTNs 8 and 9. Uh, those are homework grades that I'm going to be entering um, for Unit 5 uh, with respect to Ellison Durant-Smith's argument, shut the door, and Robert H. Clancy's uh, An Un-American Bill for OTN 9. Uh, you need to read uh, the chapter about synthesis uh, in your textbook. Uh, it's not very long. You don't need to read the uh, long selection of documents at the end of that chapter. Um, you just need to read the prose sections that are explaining concepts related to synthesis. Okay, um, and that needs to be done by next Monday. Uh, and then obviously, like I said, you need to begin drafting OTN1. All right, so... Uh, Let's talk uh, in the next uh, couple minutes here about uh, your quarter four essay. All right, your quarter four essay is going to be the sort of centerpiece, the big, the big thing uh, that you're going to be writing uh, over the next uh, month and a half. All right, so uh, it is a synthetic argument, which is to say, uh, it is an argument that uses outside resources or research uh, and pulls them together in order to develop an argument about. A specific contentious issue. All right. Now, typically, this essay is like eight to ten pages. Uh, I've actually decided uh, to make it five to seven. All right. So you could write uh, as short an essay as a five-page uh, paper, which is about half the length uh, of uh, the, the the typical essay response uh, for the AP English language course. I've just decided to do that because uh, synthesis is not on the exam. Um, so there's that practical uh, necessity of just emphasizing what's going to be on the exam, and there's also just the the the, the sort of uh, abnormal nature of, of this entire uh, extended cancellation of school and this weird time. So uh, I've just streamlined the the the, the essay um, to five to seven pages, okay? Which when you get into the argument, you're going to find that that's that that's not a great deal uh, of time to develop your essay, okay? Uh, so. Should be pretty simple lengthwise. Uh, you need to cite a directly quote from at least four outside sources that are relevant to developing your argument. Okay, so let's look quickly at the prompt. Okay, uh, in this essay, you're going to develop a research based argument about an issue of your choosing that is relevant in contemporary American society. Okay, so that sentence is intentionally incredibly vague and open ended. All right. You can talk about anything from a national political issue to a, uh, uh, an issue that is directly related to your community, Redeemer Christian School. Uh, you can talk about anything from uh, a philosophical question about the ethics of genetic uh, manufacturing uh, or, or uh, genetic alteration okay, or genetic engineering. Uh, like Daniel Lives did last year, uh, from uh, from talking about uh, the cultural value of Disney princesses. Uh, I've had good essays about everything uh, from 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 genetics to Disney princesses and everything in between. Okay, all you need to do is make sure that you persuade me that your issue is relevant, that your issue is actually important. All right. Uh, your central claim can be a claim of policy, value, or fact. All right. So you can uh, develop a, a kind of uh, argument about what we should do uh, about a certain a topic or issue. All right. You could develop uh, uh, an argument about w the nature of uh, of something's uh, goodness or or how to do something the right way uh, or a good way, a moral way. That's a little more philosophical kind uh, of essay. Uh, an example uh, uh, from the past uh, of an essay like that would be I had an essay um, a few years back about uh, the value or evaluating the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, uh, uh, about four uh, out of uh, ten uh, uh, Americans support the Black Lives Matter movement, um, according to uh, Pew Research data. Um, so it's obviously a contentious issue. And, and basically what that student did was just develop an, an argument, a, a claim of value about the value of the Black Lives Matter movement for uh, whether or not it was socially beneficial, whether or not it was going to lead to positive effects and was based on good uh, American uh, values. Okay, uh, you could also develop a, a claim of fact. All right, so this would be um, an essay centered around um, arguing whether or not something was true or valid. 
right? Um, now, the students beware of claims of fact because oftentimes uh, they oversimplify that. A, a great example of a claim of fact would be, um, for example, uh, Dr. Nato's book, Dutiful Men. All right, so that's a claim of fact that asserts that there was a, uh, a, a notable uh, observable change in the way that American society conceived of manhood and masculinity in the first 50 years of the 20th century during the Eisenhower era. Okay, And what, uh, what Pete does throughout the course of that book is he uses not four, but rather uh, hundreds of, uh, of well-researched sources uh, to develop that central thesis statement, that central claim of fact, over the course of hundreds of pages of, of, of his book. Okay, So that's obviously a really compelling, really sophisticated, professional, publishable uh, claim of fact, and, and your essay uh, can be equally sophisticated. It just needs to be uh, a little bit shorter. All right, It needs to narrow its focus. Probably shouldn't analyze 50 years of American history with respect to an issue as big as uh, conceptions of masculinity. But you could uh, talk about uh, something much smaller than that and follow a similar pattern. Yeah, you definitely could do that. All right. So the issue has to be contentious and it needs to be supported with accurate, sufficient, and relevant evidence that synthesizes at least four outside sources with your own experiences into a cogent line of reasoning. All right. So more about the focus points and how to actually execute this uh, effectively and efficiently later. But for now, I just want you to recognize that the basic assignment in front of you has been streamlined. All right. It's a research synthetic argument. All right. You need four outside resources, no annotated bibliography, which is another big uh, 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 sort of cut down. Uh, if you don't know what that is, just don't even worry about it. You don't have to work on one for this year. But you do need to begin the process of identifying the issue that you're going to explore, uh, and you need to make sure that that issue is contentious and relevant. Okay? Great. Let's go ahead and turn our attention quickly in our remaining minutes, of which we do not have many, uh, to Lecture 1, which is going to define synthesis, answering the question what synthesis is, why we do it, how we do it, and how you're going to use it over the next couple days, all right? So, I already told you in this essay assignment that you're gonna be working on a synthetic argument. Well, what is synthesis? Well, at its core, all right, synthesis uh, is really effectively embodied by this painting by Raphael that I have in the background of this lecture, okay? I really like this uh, fresco. Um, uh, Raphael painted it in the early 1500s. Uh, it's in the uh, papal courts in the Vatican. All right, uh, and it basically just uh, uh, visually embodies the process that human beings have undergone over the course of a long time, a long history, all right, uh, of attempting to, to be able to say things that are true, uh, to make judgments that are good, uh, to, to uh, develop policies that are actually wise, all right? That's obviously an ongoing conversation. Okay. In the history of the West, a lot of those kinds of conversations began, began to be codified uh, and became very famous uh, with the two central figures uh, that you see talking to each other in the middle of the painting, uh, who are Plato and Aristotle. All right, uh, Plato pointing up uh, into the sky, indicating his uh, sort of uh, platonic idealistic approach uh, to metaphysics, and uh, Aristotle pointing down to the ground. Um, uh, uh, indicating his more earthly uh, or uh, materialist approach uh, to, uh, to um, physics, uh, ethics, and, and all of the study of the world, okay? Uh, but basically, right, synthesis is just what's going on in this painting. People dialogue, dialoguing with one another, entering into conversations in an attempt to make reasonable statements, all right? So, What's synthesis? Well, let, let me put it in a way that's a little less uh, metaphorical, a little less figurative, a little less uh, allegorical. It's just a tool in argumentation that helps rhetors like you develop new, more informed positions about complex topics using multiple outside resources as springboards for their arguments. In other words, synthesis is about making arguments after you've listened to existing arguments or existing 
uh, positions, right? Why would we do that? Well, rhetorically speaking, that's a pretty redundant question. It's obvious. Why we do that is because it helps develop and cultivate the ethos of your argument by illustrating your willingness to enter into existing conversations. Okay? How can you possibly make a claim all right, in an essay, in a piece of argument that, that you are going to, that, that you uh, want to be respected? All right, that, that ought to be viewed as reliable and authoritative if you haven't shown yourself willing to enter into that existing conversation and to listen before you speak. All right, that's what synthesis is all about. It's about the process of listening, researching, reading before you begin to talk. All right, uh, synthesis also is something that we use to help support the logic or logos of our arguments. All right, uh, it's, it's a way of using the opinions of others to solidify the logos appeal of our own arguments, our own writings, our own claims. All right, so uh, you can use uh, uh, outside opinions to sort of solidify your own position if they share your position, or if they have a, a, a position that is opposite to yours, then you can deconstruct their argument, their position, their opinion, their reasoning, and uh, that shows that your reasoning is all the more valid or all the more cogent or all the more reasonable. All right. So finally, you just need to make sure that when you are entering into a synthetic argument that you take account uh, of your audience. All right. As, e as in everything in rhetoric, audience is central. So, okay, for your academic arguments and your synthetic essay, uh, of which I am the audience, it would follow that you need to make sure that your sources, your resources, are things that uh, I, as a member of uh, the academy uh, 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 in an academic situation, would look at and respect. All right, so you probably want to skip out on uh, Joe Smo's or Jane Smain's uh, blog post online and perhaps use a little more reputable uh, resource, okay? Doesn't mean you have to agree with everything that's from that quote-unquote reputable resource, but it does mean, all right, that you have sought out a valid opinion from a person who is respected in the conversation, okay? All right. Uh, how do you enter into this process of synthesis? Well, first, okay, you have to select a contentious topic that is relevant and timely and worth discussing. Many times students make a mistake during this uh, month and a half because they select an issue that isn't actually contentious. All right, and they come to me uh, a couple days before the essay is due and say, I can't find any arguments about the topic that I want to write about. It's probably because if no one is writing about it and you can't find anyone making any kinds of claims uh, that are even related to the topic that you were exploring, it's probably because it isn't contentious and it's not relevant. All right, so make sure that you selected a topic that illustrates the extent to which you understand what is relevant in your culture, what is relevant uh, and contentious in your society. All right. The second thing you want to do after you identify what you're going to be working on is you need to read the context of that issue. All right. Read around that issue. Do your background research. For example, all right, contentious topic, Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, it, is it valuable? Uh, evaluating the Black Lives Matter movement. Okay. Is it a good thing? Is it socially beneficial? All right. Well, before you get into actually voicing your opinion about that issue, it probably would be wise for you to spend a significant amount of time reading about what the Black Lives Matter movement is, what its history is, what began it, uh, what they actually did, um, uh, all of the things that are on the background before you get into evaluating it's social utility. It is wise for you to understand everything, become an expert in the background of your topic. All right. Third, that's uh, the third step uh, is once you're sort of a master of the context, that's whenever you can get into engaging with the voices that offer actual arguments uh, or more specific information with respect 
to your issue. All right. Now we'll talk more about how to engage with sources in lecture two. All right. But I just want you to understand that there's a sort of difference, a key difference, a distinguish uh, distinguisher between voices that are that are raising uh, or establishing positions about your issue, and then contextual resources. You need to have a, a balance of both in an effective synthetic argument. A balance of voices that are directly related to the question and those that help just offer context about the issue at hand, okay? Uh, fourth, you need to take notes, all right? You need to document your research process, okay? Um, the more research writing you do, especially when you get to college, the more you'll recognize that notes um, during the research pro process are e incredibly vital, all right? Because otherwise, you're just insta-scrolling through research information, uh, and it's just in one ear and out the other, okay? Uh, so you need to make sure that you're uh, taking notes, evaluating cred credibility, uh, summarizing what's uh, what's been offered in the resource. And finally, after you've done steps one, two, three, and four, that's whenever you can develop your claim about the issue that offers a fresh perspective about your topic. All right? So don't start with your opinion. Listen first, construct your opinion, and then voice it. Uh, and then you can begin the process of organizing how your essay is going to go about uh, offering a line of reasoning that supports your uh, claim. Okay? So, last how. How are you going to uh, use a synthesis in the coming month and a half? Well, you're going to write a multi-draft research-based argument uh, about a contentious issue in, in American culture. Already talked about that. And also, you're going to write impromptu synthetic essays like you would have on the AP language exam for your Unit 6 test, which is going to require you to exhibit similar kinds of skills Except, all right, it's not going to be about an issue that you selected and that you uh, read about and write about uh, or think about for a long period of time, but rather uh, a selection of documents and sources that you're going to engage with in one sitting uh, in an impromptu setting, and then you're going to write a response, an argument of response in light of the information in those sources. All right, that's all I have for you today. I hope you guys are doing excellently well. Um, we've got uh, quite a bit to do uh, to get ready for your exam on May 20th and to get ready to turn your essay uh, in the middle of May. Two major uh, assignments left for us. We've got our, uh, our, our final uh, our, our exam that we're going to take uh, from the College Board, and we've also, of course, uh, got our synthesis essay. Okay, So uh, eyes on the prize. Let's finish strong. Um, we've got a few big things to get done. Uh, let's do them well. All right. Take it easy.